Hey guys, I'm not sure if you can see me or hear me yet, but if you can stand by, my computer's getting all booted up and everything and ready to go. So um, I will be ready to go here in just a second. Um, so give me one second here, let's do a live video, title of broadcast, artifacts. You would think there would be an easier way to do this. All right, so stand by. I'll be with you in a moment. All right, I think we are ready to go. Just making sure that everything is plugged up. Again, uh, it's kind of weird when you use Zoom on Facebook Live um, to get everything set up. Um, right now, I don't know. It doesn't look like I'm live because the computer's getting all booted up and everything. So uh, the last time I did this, Apparently, I was recording and I didn't even know it. So, anyway, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, hang on one second. Let me make sure that everything's working well. And once I get the kind of green light that we are on record, then we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I do apologize if you can hear me from for last time. I I, I should have known that there was no way I could get through three thousand years of Old Testament history. Uh, in uh, in one Facebook lecture, uh, but in any case, uh, I think we're gonna we're gonna finish it up tonight. So um, uh, yeah, so I'm gonna I've got some really really amazing stuff to share with you guys tonight, and I hope that you are ready to go. And uh, I'm ready to go. There's uh, just so much. As I said in the um, uh, in the in the first lecture, the Oriental Institute. Obviously, uh, of course, it's at the University of Chicago, and there are tens of thousands of artifacts. And what you see when you actually visit the museum is only a small fraction of the thousands of artifacts that they have collected for over 100 years. In fact, last year, uh, the Oriental Institute actually celebrated its 100th anniversary for being an archaeological institute. Um, and by the way, while I'm at it, I'll go ahead and mention a couple other things. I'm, I, I meant to mention this last time, uh, and that is uh, there are a couple of other schools in the United States that have a really long history of, uh, of doing archaeology in the Near East. And the other one is the University of Pennsylvania uh, and, uh, and then Harvard University. Now, there are other schools as well that do archaeology. I'm aware of that. Uh, but uh, the University of Chicago, Oriental Institute, it was started in 1919 by, um, uh, by uh, James Henry Breasted, uh, was one of the first archaeological institutes of America. He was actually the first uh, person in America to receive a PhD in Egyptology. That was uh, uh, James Henry Breasted. And then, uh, and then of course, uh, Harvard University has done archaeology in the Near East as well. So in any way, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started, and um, I'm making sure that um, we are on get, get folks uh, a minute to get signed on. And I just want to make sure that everything's working well. And then once I once I sort of can see that, then we're going to go ahead and get started with the lecture tonight. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking obviously about uh, what we didn't get to last time, which is the uh, Hittite civilization, uh, primarily Anatolia, which is We'll talk about that in a second. From it's a geographical term, um, and then also we're going to talk about uh, ancient Persia as well. So I can see that we are live and we have uh, people viewing it. So that's good, and I know that there'll be more people joining us as we move along. So anyway, so let's go ahead and get started. And I'm going to do a share screen. So stand by for that, and we will go ahead and get started. All righty. Okay, Hittites and Persia, artifacts from the Oriental Institute Museum, part two. As you can see, I have my Lamasu t-shirt on uh, from the Oriental Institute. Um, you can't go there and not get a, a Lamasu t-shirt from ancient uh, Assyria. So I decided to wear that tonight because um, it's actually also in one of the uh, photographs that I'm gonna share with you guys tonight. Uh, when I was in Turkey, 
last uh, October, and uh, I had this shirt on at the uh, Istanbul Archaeological Museum. I thought it would be kind of cool to wear an OI t-shirt at the, uh, at the uh, Archaeological Institute or Archaeological Museum in, in Istanbul, Turkey. So, so anyway, let's go ahead and get started and, uh, and, and basically kind of review. We, we, uh, we talked about the Oriental Institute and uh, in its place in the history of ancient Near Eastern archaeology. And they start out in the museum. When you walk in the museum, the very first thing you see is the Mesopotamian gallery. And if you remember that term, Mesopotamia means land between the rivers. And of course, what we're talking about is the, uh, the, the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. Uh, so that's what we're talking about. And as you move through the museum, you move through different uh, uh, geographical regions of the uh, area of the Middle East that uh, that James Henry Breasted called, in fact, he coined the term, the Fertile Crescent. So basically, it's uh, if you know where Israel is and you sort of look at an archway that goes all the way from Israel to the north into Lebanon and Syria, and then, and then it dips up into Turkey, uh, and then it goes down into Iraq, uh, down into the, uh, in between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. So that's the Fertile Crescent. So as you move to the museum, you go through the different areas that the OI has excavated. And one of the things that uh, James Henry Breasted wanted to do when he founded the OI was to study the foundations of civilization. Now, uh, up until that time, uh, many universities in Europe were already studying in earnest uh, the civilizations of classical Greece and Rome, known as the classical civilizations, of course. And uh, so, you know, quite a, quite a lot of, bit of information was known about them and, and uh, scholars had long, it, I'm pretty sure it's, it's always sort of been known, is Greek and Latin. Those languages really sort of stayed with uh, European culture, uh, but many of the ancient Near Eastern languages had gone extinct. And so many scholars uh, didn't know how to read, for instance, hieroglyphics up until the decipherment of the Rosetta Stone. Uh, by the French scholar Champollion in 1820s and 1822. And then uh, tonight we're going to talk about another very important inscription for understanding um, uh, some of the languages that we see in Persia and Iraq. Uh, and uh, that is known as the Behistun inscription. So we'll talk about that. So the Behistun inscription is sort of like the Rosetta Stone uh, of, of ancient um, Iran and Iraq. So we'll talk about that. So, so in 1929, uh, the University of Chicago, and we'll talk about this uh, in, in other dates, uh, did surveys in Anatolia. So let's look at a map. Let me go back and let's look at the map. Uh, this is at the OI. This is the map of the OI. So that term, it's a geographical term, Anatolia, and it refers to that, uh, that, that land mass on, on the Asian continent uh, that is north of Syria. So you see Syria down there, Aleppo, Syria, and uh, you see Ebla, you see some of the names down there along the coast there. There's another site called Ugarit. Uh, by the way, Ugarit, uh, we're not going to talk about it tonight, but uh, it is one of the most important sites for understanding um, Canaanite culture. Uh, in fact, that is where scholars uh, discovered uh, something called the Baal cycle. So if we want to understand uh, uh, the Old Testament, and we want, we want to understand uh, how the, uh, some of the Israelites interacted with the religion of the Canaanites, the site of Ugar, it was a very, very important site archaeologically, and now it is in the modern day Syria. So, but north of there, that is the Anatolia, and it is a very large landmass. Um, as I said, I was in Turkey uh, back in October of last year, and uh, it's very possible. In fact, it's looking like it's, it's looking like it's very likely that I'm going to be back in Turkey uh, this coming fall, and I'm very excited about that. And I'll be sharing more about that. I can't say anything right now, but uh, it looks like I may be going back to Turkey. We are working on an archaeological project over there. But in any case, um, you see there on the top of the map there in Anatolia is Istanbul, which is uh, where the ancient old city of First, it was a city called Byzantium, or, uh, and that's where, the, where we get the word Byzantine Empire. And then, of course, uh, Constantine the Great uh, founded the city of, of Constantinople, or uh, Constantinople uh, there uh, in the fourth century. So uh, it, uh, it's there, there on a narrow strait uh, on the Bosporus Strait, linking the uh, uh, 
uh, leaking the Black Sea down into the Bosporus or the Mamara Sea. And then over to the west, you have Greece. So Anatolia is a very, very large stretch of land. And uh, one of the sites that I want to point you to and uh, I have to kind of direct you. So if you look at the A at the end of Anatolia and you sort of go up a little bit to your right, you'll see a city called Hattusha. Hattusha. Uh, that's tonight we're going to talk about Hattusha. Um, also, one other little quick thing, uh, note as we're talking about the geography of Anatolia, um, the Oriental Institute uh, has ongoing projects, which we're going to get to in just a moment, uh, that are still ongoing uh, in, in Turkey, in the central part of Turkey. And uh, so we'll talk about that. Also, one other little quick word uh, you see at, at the end of a uh, couple of words there, Kadir, uh, Kadir Hoyuk, H-O-Y-U-K. And the letters have an umlaut, like a German umlaut over the top of them. Um, that is because, uh, well, several different reasons. I'm, it's hard for me because sometimes I get off on these little rabbit trails. So, uh, so I have to reel myself in. <laughs> but uh, Germany has, has a long history of doing archaeology in Turkey uh, because Germany and Turkey have been allies uh, for many years, militarily, politically. So the Germans have been digging there. Tonight, we're going to talk about a German archaeologist uh, who discovered the site of Hattusha. But the word Hoyuk is the same, it's the Turkish version of the word tell. So, so whenever you may know that term, a tell, like an archaeological tell, T-E-L-L, -L, or T-E-L, or sometimes it's, it's spelled T-A-L, uh, all Arabic variations on artificial mound. So in Turkey, it's called a Hoyuk. Whereas in down in the Levant, in the Transjordan and Israel uh, and Syria, it's called a tell. So, uh, so anyway, just so some nomenclature for you, so you'll know, like Shatal Hoyuk, which means the mound of Hoyuk. Uh, 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 Golbeki Tepe is also a mound as well. Uh, so anyway, I'm getting off track here. So the main thing I want you to see about the map there is I just want you to see the geographical area of Anatolia and sort of how it sort of stretches across the broad expanse there just north of, of the Levant. The Hittites. The Hittites are mentioned over 60 times in the Old Testament. So uh, before we get into the Oriental Institute's discoveries in Turkey, uh, we're going to talk about the Hittites because uh, some of the artifacts um, directly relate. Some of them are, are, are sort of uh, roundabout related to the Hittites. I'll explain that in a minute. So before we get into that, though, I do want to talk about the Hittites and how they relate to the Old Testament. So Hittites are mentioned over 60 times in the Old Testament. Uh, Abraham encountered the Hittites at Hebron. Uh, Esau married three Hittite women in Genesis. Uh, the Hittites are also included uh, in a list of seven people groups in Palestine in Deuteronomy 7.1. And they're also listed as one of the group of people that Israel failed to drive out of the land in Judges chapter 3, verse 5. Also, you'll remember that in 2 Samuel, uh, basically uh, states that Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, was also a Hittite. You remember that episode, that horrible episode in the life of David, where David had him uh, sent into the front of battle, and he was killed, but he was a Hittite. And then also there are additional references to the Hittites, including Genesis 26, Joshua, 1 Kings uh, 10, 1 Kings 11, among many others. Again, there are 60 references. So at this point, let me just say something about that, because I don't want to skip over this. I think it's a very important point to make. Okay, so before we talk about the discovery of the Hittites, let me just say a word about, uh, about this discovery that we're going to talk about here in just a second. And that is the, the only place uh, in the Bible uh, the only up into the 20th century, the only known historical reference to the Hittites was actually in the Bible, uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, and this is really big. And uh, there was a very important book that was published in 1859. If you know that date, then you'll know the, the book I'm talking about. That is the book by Charles Darwin called On the Origin of Species. And of course, uh, Europe, uh, many universities in Europe, uh, Germany first, I don't know what it is about Germany, but Germany first, and then uh, filtering into France and England, uh, biblical scholars began to be 
begin to take in a, a lot of anti-supernaturalistic philosophy into their uh, departments of biblical studies, uh, and then uh, ultimately it culminated in a very important book uh, that uh, mo every student of the Old Testament really needs to know about, and that is um, uh, the book by the German scholar Julius Wellhausen, uh, in which he proposed a documentary hypothesis. Uh, basically, that there were four independent authors of the Pentateuch. Moses didn't write the Pentateuch. It was basically four independent writers. But really, what's most important about the documentary hypothesis about Darwinism in the, in the 19th century in Europe was that uh, archaeology was born in a climate of great skepticism toward the Bible scientifically. So that's what you need to know. You need to know that archaeology, biblical archaeology, was even, in fact, uh, yeah, I would even say that. The biblical archaeology was born in a period in which there was really great skepticism of the Bible. And so, uh, so up until the 20th century, the only known historical source or, or, or reference to the Hittites was actually in the text itself. In 1906, near the bend of the Halas River, uh, located near the modern Turkish bil uh, village of Bogazkal, uh, uh, German archaeologist Hugo Winkler, who was an Assyriologist, started a full-scale excavation of the site based on uh, an earlier survey by two French scholars, Charles Textier and Ernst Chantre. Uh, in 1834. So they did these surveys and then finally uh, Winkler went and conducted a full-scale excavation of this particular site. After several years of digging, Winkler unearthed an entire library containing 10,000 clay tablets, uh, 1906 to 1907, and then uh, skipping a year, uh, 1911 to 1912. The tablets were written in Hittite, Akkadian, Sumerian, hieroglyphics. Now, Akkadian was known at the time, or at least it was uh, thought about, and they sort of kind of knew that it was uh, a cuneiform script, but uh, there were other, uh, other tablets were written in a language that Winkler did not recognize. This was a new language, a, and it was a sort of a pictographic language uh, on these tablets. Uh, well, part, some of them were pictographic, some of them were, they looked like a sort of a cuneiform script. Uh, so the decipherment of the Hittite script took, so, uh, well, took sub, several decades of work by linguists, and today there are still uh, many tablets that remain untranslated. Uh, so if you're out there watching this and you wanted to go into archaeology, one of the things that you could do is you could come here to Chicago and uh, become a student of archaeology at the Oriental Institute and study some of the uh, untranslated Hittite tablets because many of them remain untranslated. In fact, there are not just the Hittite tablets. There are a lot of many texts uh, that remain untranslated. I will say this. This is a good point to kind of insert this into this uh, discussion, and that is that it's, this is just my thoughts on this. A lot of archaeology is still left to be done, and the artifacts are not in the ground. The artifacts have already been taken out of the ground. The artifacts are just, had, just haven't, been, haven't been interpreted yet. So one of the things that archeologists do, and part of the process of archeology span is we survey first, we wanna survey a site, then we mark the site off, we excavate the site, we, uh, we curate, we clean the artifacts, we interpret the artifacts, and then we, uh, we will have to decipher the artifacts. So many of the artifacts actually have writing on them, and many of them actually are untranslated. So, uh, so anyway, that, that's a cool thing if you ever wanted to go into that. Uh, the University of Chicago is compiling the Chicago Hittite Dictionary. I am not sure off the top of my head of my memory. Um, I've had a super busy day today, so I can't remember off the top of my head if it's actually complete now. Um, I know that, again, based on what we just said, that some of the, some of the uh, tablets have untranslated, but I'm not sure if the actual dictionary is complete. I think they may still be adding volumes to the dictionary. So this is an actual front piece of the uh, Chicago Hittite Dictionary. Uh, this one, this one is, uh, was published in 1997 uh, by Hans Gruderbach and Henry, Harry Hoffner. And I am pretty sure that you can go, in fact, you can Google 
uh, the Hittite Dictionary Project, and it will bring up, and you can actually purchase the entire thing online. And I think there are several volumes that you can actually look through um, for free. There are PDFs. Um, so I don't know where you would learn Hittite. You might have to go find a Hittite grammar, but you could do it if you could do it if you wanted to. Sorry about that. I thought I had my turn my phone turned off. So in any case, uh, that's pretty cool. This is a tablet, one of the Hittite uh, clay tablets. You can see there the cuneiform uh, Song of Silver. This is uh, from the Oriental Institute. And uh, so the Hittite script, the scholar A.H. Uh, Sace and a missionary working in Damascus named William Wright. Now, I don't know if we're related. That would be really cool if I were related to William Wright, who helped make the suggestion, but I don't know if I am or not. I have no idea. Uh, but William Wright first suggested uh, that the ancient inscriptions that Winkler discovered in this archive were actually from the ancient Hittite civilization mentioned in the Bible. They were the first ones to mention this. Now, can you imagine um, the, uh, the climate at the time? Again, 1909, this is, uh, you know, uh, about 40 years or so after Darwin's uh, book on the origin of species. So, um, so anyway, this is, uh, this is pretty cool. And it turns, out, it turns out they were actually right. And uh, what Winkler discovered is a place called Hattusha. And this is actually the site as it looks today. Uh, you can see there the archeological ruins in the foreground. In the background, what you see is a partially reconstructed building based on the archeology. span In fact, uh, I am, if my understanding is correct on this, I believe that Hattusha uh, is one of the largest archeological sites in Turkey. Not, maybe not the largest, but it certainly uh, ranks up there as one of the largest archeological sites in Turkey. Uh, now, archeology span of course is ongoing and uh, you, it's very rare do uh, archeologists dig an entire city to bedrock. Uh, so I would be really surprised if they have pretty much uncovered the entire city of Hattusha. There are large portions of uh, Pompeii and Herculaneum in Italy that are still under the ground as well. So, uh, so in any case, uh, there are there's still there are still things left to be discovered, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, the OI. This is the little a couple of words here about the Oriental Institute uh, in Anatolia. Um, one very important scholar that you may need to know about. There are, in fact, uh, this is kind of a fun fact here, uh, is a guy named Robert Braidwood. Robert Braidwood uh, conducted something called the Amok Plains Project between 1932 and 1938. Uh, Robert Braidwood. So you've got two very important scholars at the Oriental Institute. The first one is James Henry Breasted, and the other one is Robert Braidwood. And some people have conjectured that these two guys were the uh, were George Lucas's uh, inspiration for Indiana Jones and um, and Ravenwood what was his name I forgot it's one of the guys on uh, on the Indiana Jones movies um, Marion Ravenwood of course was uh, Indy's love interest but um, it was her father that he worked with but Robert Braidwood is maybe who it was based on, but this guy was a real scholar, and this is a very, very important project. In fact, here's a little uh, little uh, clip here from the OI about the Amuk project. A survey of the uh, of Amuk. This is an, an area in Turkey in Anatolia on behalf of the OI, pioneering many survey techniques still in use today, are still in use today. Actually, uh, Braidwood and his team discovered 180 and 78 ancient settlements. Eight of these sites spanning many different periods were excavated, including Shatal Hoyuk, Tel Dahab, uh, Tel Imar Sharik, Shariki, and uh, Chel, uh, Tel Judadaya, if I'm saying that correctly, Tel Kurdu, and Tel Tainat. Uh, the pottery and other artifacts excavated at these sites provide one of the longest and most reliable chronological sequences of stratified cultural material in the entire Near East. Archaeologists still use Braidwood's Amuk sequence as a, as a means of dating sites elsewhere in the Levant. So all of that is sort of a technical way of saying something that I've talked about before to you guys, and, and that is that archaeologists, we date sites by pottery. And so by doing this 
uh, doing the survey of all of these 178 ancient settlements, he was able to create a ceramic typological base to get a sequence of what the pottery looks like because pottery styles change over time. And uh, just like Coke bottle styles change over time, you know, a Coke bottle back in the 1800s is looked different than it did today. Uh, maybe it wasn't 18, maybe it was like 1890s. I don't know. Now it's a plastic bottle. But the, the point is, is that just like Coke bottles change over time, pottery styles change over time. And those stylistic changes as they change over time are what archaeologists use to date certain areas in the Middle East. And so what he's talking about there is this uh, Amok project is a very reliable uh, ceramic typological base for dating uh, pottery in the Levant. Pretty cool. All right. Uh, also, one other little quick thing about Robert Braidwood. Uh, he and his wife, Linda Braidwood, led the first systematic expeditions to uh, in Iran, Iraq, Turkey, focusing on uh, one of the most, sig most significant transitions in human history, and that is the origins of agriculture. Uh, Braidwood, the, the Braidwood expeditions were also the first to involve a team of scientists, so involving uh, multidisciplinary scientists such as botanists, zoologists, and geologists to document the process and the context of the domestication of cornerstone crop and livestock species. Uh, so again, uh, one of the things we talked about in the previous lecture is the question, again, I'm going to insert this in there. This is a little, going to be a little controversial for some of you who don't, may not have the same views that I do on this. I do hold to a global flood. I do hold that God destroyed the world, the, the ancient world with a flood. And uh, Mount Ararat is in far eastern Turkey on the border of Iran, just south of, our, of modern day Armenia. And what's interesting is that uh, after the flood, again, according to our, our theory, and not just myself, but other scholars and friends that I follow, uh, the earth went really, really cold. And as the earth began to warm up, uh, humans began to be more and more sedentary and live in one place. And so this actually makes sense that uh, agriculture would start uh, in Anatolia. It just makes sense archeologically. So anyway, I know that some of you, some of you listening don't believe in a global flood and uh, it's not a matter of salvation, uh, but it is a matter of, I believe, a hermeneutical uh, integrity. And I also believe there's some really good uh, geological evidence for this as well. Uh, so what a, a current project today uh, of the OI uh, in Turkey, I actually went uh, late last year or was it earlier this year? I think it was earlier this year actually. Uh, an archaeologist there, uh, James Osborne, really great guy. Uh, at, he and I actually know some of the same people. Um, I was actually trained uh, by Dr. James Harden, uh, who went to the University of Arizona, studied under Bill Deaver. And uh, so, so James knew Jimmy and some of the other people that I know at the Cobb Institute, where I went and got my degree in archaeology. But anyway, so he gave a lecture on this current project that the OI is involved in. Uh, in 2019, discoveries made by the Konya Regional Archaeological Survey Project, directed by Michelle Massa and the Turkmen Karel Hoyuk Intensive Survey Project, directed by James Osborne, brought to light exciting new evidence for a hitherto unknown Iron Age kingdom in southern Anatolia, the site of Turkmen uh, Karel Hoyuk, newly recognized to be one of the largest bronze and Iron Age sites in Turkey, is almost certainly the royal seat of a king named Hartapu. Uh, a long mysterious figure in Anatolian history and scholarship but whose hieroglyphic Luane, Luwian inscription just found at the site describes his exploits across the country. At the same time, archeological data from the region indicates uh, the likely extent of his kingdom and his extensive fortification system. This is actually directly from the OI. When I actually, earlier this year, when I actually heard the lecture, uh, it was uh, Dr. Osborne, and I believe also Michelle was there as well who gave uh, part of that lecture uh, of their, uh, of this discovery of uh, King Hartapu's kingdom. And it is ongoing. So, uh, so just so you know, uh, the OI, the Oriental Institute, is still doing projects in central Anatolia, and they're discovering new things about uh, this kingdom. There's so much that I could share with you guys about Turkey. We could spend two entire webinars just on the history of the Hittites and Turkey and Anatolia and all this. Uh, there's another Iron Age kingdom 
bronze Iron Age kingdom uh, called the Urartu uh, that's in Eastern Turkey. And I actually got to meet and he's, he actually gave, I'll show it to you right now, but I can't reach it. Uh, he actually gave me three of his books when I was there in October, but I, uh, one of the projects that I'm working on right now in Turkey is with uh, the uh, Turkish archaeologist, Dr. Okte Belli. And Dr. Belli uh, is, I think he's now retired. I know last year he was getting ready to retire, uh, but he is, uh, he's one of the head archaeologists at Istanbul University in Istanbul, Turkey. And uh, his area of expertise is in the Urartu Kingdom, spelled U-R-A-R-U-T-U. Uh, I think that's how you spell it. Urartu. It's hard to say. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's a whole other fascinating thing. Uh, I actually got to see some uh, Urartu ruins when I was in eastern Turkey. And uh, that's a whole other rabbit trail. Uh, but because they don't really figure into biblical history, uh, we're really not going to talk about it tonight. But I did want to give you some of the most current uh, ex expeditions of, of the Hittites. Let me share with you one really, a couple of really cool sources that I learned about uh, from uh, Dr. Osborne uh, at the lecture, and it's a website that you can go to called HittiteMonuments.com, HittiteMonuments.com, and I believe uh, it is uh, managed by, uh, I think it's a school in Turkey, I'm not sure. I know that you have to translate the page into English. So if you go to the site HittiteMonuments.com and it's not in English, then click on, on the upper right, you'll see a little, a little tag and click on the English, it'll translate it for you. Uh, you could also probably do, do Google Translate as well. But this is really cool, it's like an interactive map of all of the major Hittite monuments in Turkey. Really cool. And you can see some of them are, go all the way down into Syria as well. A lot of these boundaries that you see uh, were not as clear cut in the ancient world because people groups moved around and you can see these Hittite monuments all around. So basically, if you go to this website, HittiteMonuments.com, you click on one of the uh, names and it will bring up uh, photographs and, uh, and maps of some of these other Hittite and Neo-Hittite period monuments. One other really cool project that the OI is involved in is something called CAMEL, uh, C-A-M-E-L, it's an acronym. Uh, it stands for the Center for Ancient Middle Eastern Landscapes. And what it is, is it's an interactive map uh, of remote sensing, aerial photography, and topographic maps. It sort of is a modern version, in fact, they still, it's, they still have a completely separate thing uh, called the uh, epigraphic project that the OI, in fact, I've, I have uh, one of the cool things about living in Chicago and getting to actually visit the OI is at their bookshop, they actually have for sale some of the prints of some of their expeditions to Egypt in the Middle East. And these are really high quality black and white photographs of many of the ancient monuments of Egypt. And so I'm gonna show you one that I got right here, this one is actually uh, of an 18th dynasty Egyptian temple. And uh, it was the 18th, uh, toward the middle of the 18th dynasty uh, that we believe the Exodus occurred um, during the reign of a pharaoh by the name of Amenhotep II. And so this is a really cool photograph. I'm gonna get it framed eventually. But anyway, uh, so click on this, go to, you can probably Google uh, Oriental Institute Camel Project and uh, scroll down and you can click on uh, a satellite photograph of the Near East and learn about geography and landscape. Um, but one of the things, uh, one of the reasons why they got involved in, uh, this is back 100 years ago when, when they were taking photographs, it's, it's, it's just simply because in, not all, but many of the Middle Eastern countries, even back then 100 years ago, were politically unstable. And, uh, and then not only that, not that the only reason, but also just because of erosion, because of weathering, earthquakes, natural things. Uh, they wanted to get a record of many of these ancient monuments. So they uh, started the epigraphic project and took, uh, used photography. Where they were one of the first ones to use photography, um, not the first. Uh, that was a guy uh, that was uh, the first one to use photography for archaeology, I believe, was Hiram Bingham, I think in South America with uh, Machu Picchu. Don't quote me on that, you can look it up. But the Oriental Institute was, they did pioneering work in using photography for archeology. span And that is something that interests me. 
In fact, uh, my, in my project in Turkey, that is uh, what I'm going to be doing is a, a lot of the uh, imaging uh, uh, of the project that we're working on. So anyway, uh, really cool project. Uh, check that out. CAMEL, Center for Ancient Mid Middle Eastern Landscapes. All right. So here are some of the artifacts from the Amuk project. And you notice there uh, the pottery is, has a red color and it has beautiful red clay that's fired and uh, shows you just some of the artifacts there uh, at really cool uh, vessels that you can see, very ornate, uh, very elaborate. Uh, one of them, it's actually a photograph of it. And I have an actual, uh, what I call an artifact graph, graphic uh, for Epic Archaeology. You can go to artifact graphics and, and find out many of the artifacts that we create you can actually use for PowerPoint slides or whatever. Uh, but we'll show you that in a minute. Uh, but that one in the middle is really cool. It looks like a cluster of grapes, and it's a vessel very likely contained wine. I'm pretty sure it did. Here is the, here's the actual, it's called the uh, Inundic vase. Uh, it's from the old Hittite kingdom uh, dating to around 1600 BC. It was discovered by Hugo Winkler in 1906. You see how elaborate it is. And then, of course, there's another uh, to the side of it, to the right of it, is a fragment of the Song of Silver, which is uh, another fragment from the Oriental Institute here in Chicago. So this is actually, this photograph or this little uh, artifact graphic is on our Facebook page if you go to pictures, and I believe it's also on our website. If it's not, I need to, I need to download it, but you can get this, and if you want it, I will send it to you for free. So here are a few artifacts from the OI of the Hittite, some of the Hittite uh, artifacts that um, Robert Braidwood and the University of Chicago discovered in their Amok project. And, and I'm going to go ahead and let you guys know, I'm going to show you not only uh, some artifacts from the Oriental Institute, which is what this lecture is about, but I'm also going to show you some artifacts from Istanbul, Turkey, because that is also where the Hittites, uh, that's of course where they live, and they, they lived, and that's where uh, many of the artifacts are today. And because I want you to see the continuity between the artifacts here in Chicago and also in Turkey as well. But you see one of the themes you're gonna see over and over again, uh, uh, artistically, is the lion. See there, you can see the little uh, lion face. This is in Turkey. This is in the Archeological uh, Museum in Istanbul. And these are Hittite lions. Pretty neat. This is also in Istanbul Museum. And you can see there uh, one of the kings. I don't know his name off the top of my head, but it is a Hittite king. And he is on the base of this. You can see the lions uh, that he's standing on. Another really great example of a lion from uh, Istanbul. This is not uh, Chicago. So these are bonus slides that you get. Another very interesting thing there, you notice there the stone, the color of the stone. Uh, why is that the case? This is actually because it is a volcanic basalt. And, uh, or I think that's what it is. It's, it's, it's affected by the, the actual uh, minerals in the stone itself, which I think there's some volcanism involved. But uh, in Israel, uh, the Chorazin synagogue, as well as the uh, synagogue that dates to the first century, uh, is also in the, right along the banks of the Sea of Galilee is also carved out of this very similar looking rock. And there is uh, me beside one of the, you can see the size of this thing, this big Hittite lion, and I have my OI t-shirt on uh, beside the lion. This is in the entrance to the uh, Istanbul Archaeological Museum in Turkey. And if you want to know more about the Hittites, uh, check our article out on epicarchaeology.org, uh, the discovery of the Hittites. And you can see there, this is the entrance to Hattusha. And you notice on the side of the entrance, you've got, again, the lions. Uh, that theme is going to come back again and again. One other article that I want to point you to as well that contains a lot of uh, links and a lot of really, I think, helpful information. It is more of a survey article. So Turkey is a very rich land when it comes to biblical sites, not just in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament as well. Uh, Paul is from Tarsus, 
in Asia Minor, which was Turkey. Uh, an interesting fact about this, I don't know if you knew this or not, this is completely outside and then left field there, but um, do you know who actually met in the port of Tarsus uh, before Paul was born, just, just a few years before Paul was born? It was Mark Anthony and Cleopatra. They actually met what right off the coast of Tarsus in Asia Minor. Really interesting. Thought that was kind of cool. The Apostle Paul, uh, very, a very important place that figures into Roman history. Uh, you've got Cleopatra, Mark Anthony. So that was pretty cool. Anyway, so check that article out also on Epic Archaeology. So ancient Persia. We're going to end with ancient Persia. By the way, this is also not at the OI. This is at, uh, I believe, in Berlin, but I'm not sure. I had this picture on my computer, so I used it. But it does, uh, it is from ancient Persia. So the Achaemenid Empire is what, is what it is called. The founder of the Achaemenid Empire is a king by the name, a Persian king by the name of Cyrus the Great. And there are uh, one very important archaeological discovery associated with Cyrus, known as the Cyrus Cylinder, which I'll show you a picture of in just a second. And also, uh, the tomb of Cyrus is also known as well. Of course, his body is not in there. Um, Cambyses is the second king in the Achaemenid Empire. Uh, Smyrtus, uh, Mardia, uh, 529 to 522 BC. And then uh, another very important figure in the Achaemenid Empire is Darius the Great, Darius the First, uh, whose date reigns from 521 to 486 BC. He was the builder of a, a place called Persepolis. Uh, it's mentioned in uh, Ezra chapter 6, verse 14. Clay bricks actually contain uh, his name from the site of Persepolis. His son was another very important figure in Old Testament history, and that is Xerxes the uh, first. His dates uh, range from 485, 86 to 465 BC. And of course, we know that uh, he was uh, uh, taken with the Jewish princess Esther, also known as Hadassah. His son uh, was a king by the name of Artaxerxes I, uh, who also went by the name of Longimanus, uh, Longimanus, however you want to say that. 464 to 424 BC, uh, mentioned in Ezra, Nehemiah as well. Uh, archaeologically, there's a couple of artifacts associated with, with Artaxerxes, something called a silver bowl inscription of Artaxerxes I, uh, elephant, elephantine papyri, and then also his tomb, was discovered at Persepolis. So that's not all of the Achaemenid kings, but those are the, are the first few that I wanted to give you, just to kind of give you a, a kind of an idea of, uh, of kind of time frame what we're talking about. And uh, also to show you this map here, this is from a really great website that I, that I use sometimes called Ancient History Encyclopedia. It's pretty cool. I'm sure you guys have seen that. Uh, but this is the geographical extent of the, per, of, of the Persian Empire or the Achaemenid Empire. Uh, I mean, it was math. In fact, it was one of the largest empires in the ancient world. And uh, when you have an empire that large, uh, people want to uh, kind of dethrone you. And of course, we know uh, later in its history, it was uh, taken over by Alexander the Great. Uh, of course, they were always, the, the Persians and the Greeks were always fighting each other. And if you ever seen the movie 300, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. It's a fictional movie, but uh, it's kind of based on some, you know, loose history. Uh, but a couple of points, uh, a couple of things I want to point out on this map here. Uh, the uh, center of power in Persia, you notice the Persian Gulf there. Uh, uh, two sites, Persepolis and Parsagad, Persagade, however you want to say that, Parsagad, Gade. I think that's, it's a French word, I think. Uh, but Persepolis is the one that we are going to look at, and it's where the OI uh, did some work. Uh, so the Oriental Institute conducted archaeological campaigns at Persepolis under the direction of Ernst Hertzfeld and Eric Schmidt in the 30s, right before World War II, of course. And when wars go on, you can't do archaeology, uh, obviously. This is, that was also true in World War I as well, except, uh, well, yeah, that's true. I was going to say something else about that, but I won't. Um, they were able to trace the plan of the ancient city, observing that the places, uh, they should say palaces, the palaces and public buildings were erected on a, uh, a, a stone masonry terrace. 
uh, some distance from the city proper. So, uh, so basically, there's this giant raised platform this thing was built on. Uh, pretty crazy. You'll, you'll see that here in a second. The entire city was surrounded by a triple fortification system with uh, one row of towers and walls running over the crest of the mountains. So the next picture is actually the OI sketch of Persepolis. And you can see there, uh, massive area. This whole entire thing, by the way, is raised up. It's actually on a raised platform. You actually have to walk up and you're gonna see that here in a second. But a couple of things I wanna point out to you uh, in the red to the left there of the, of the site is something called the uh, Apadana, the Apadana. What in the world is that? That means the audience hall. That's literally what that means. Then you, in the blue, you've got the throne room and the kind of purple blue color, you have the treasury. And then in the little small, you got the palace of Darius, green, the council hall in kind of purplish, I don't know what that color is, uh, fuchsia, uh, Artaxerxes tomb. Then you've got the palace of Xerxes. So you see how uh, throughout its history, uh, the site would be added to by the kings, the Achaemenid kings. Uh, but the one thing I want you to know is that this entire thing was upheld by these massive towering columns that were just absolutely tremendously amazing, which you're going to see in just a second. Because the OI actually has some of the capitals, some of the tops of the columns from Persepolis. This is a, uh, from the OI, this is an inscription in glazed brick uh, from the Apadana, which is the audience hall uh, from uh, the period of Xerxes. Uh, basically, it's it written in Old Persian. It says, Xerxes, the great king, by the favor of Ahura Mazda, Darius, the king who is my father, built and planned much that was good. By the favor, favor of Ahura Mazda, I added to that which had been built and made it excellent. Uh, may Ahura Mazda together with the other gods protect me and my kingdom. Uh, by the way, Ahura Mazda was the, uh, considered to be the wise lord and the foremost god of the Achaemenid Empire. They were uh, Zoroastrians. So that's where Zoroastrianism comes from. In fact, there are still people today who practice Zoroastrianism. So you may or may not have known that. Um, so one other thing, this is not in the OI, but I, I thought this would be a good uh, time to bring this up. Uh, Darius I also, not only did he build Persepolis, there was a very important inscription. Earlier I mentioned uh, the importance of the Rosetta Stone. Uh, and I mentioned this in the previous lecture, we talked about uh, the three languages in the Rosetta Stone. You've got uh, on the bottom, you've got Greek in the middle of the Rosetta Stone. You've got a language called Demotic. And on the top, you've got hieroglyphics. And so uh, in the 1820s, uh, the Rosetta Stone was finally deciphered by the French scholar Champollion, and it helped unlock uh, how to read hieroglyphics throughout the ancient world, throughout especially, well, Egypt especially. Uh, so it gave Egyptologists a insight, further insight into Egyptian culture, into Egyptian mind, into Egyptian religion, into Egyptian thought. And so uh, in, uh, in Mesopotamia, uh, the uh, Mesopotamian version of that is something called the Behistun inscription, and it was carved by Darius the Great. Imagine uh, that this thing was 300 feet off the ground, and it was in one of the trade routes that people would actually walk by, and it actually was a trilingual inscription, so it contained three languages, and you see there the little symbol of Ahura Mazda there in the middle of it with Darius there to the left. You can see this is uh, taken from the ground. You can see how high it is. Uh, you had to be a rock climber to get up to it. Uh, the Behistun inscription. And there is a really better picture of it. You can see there Darius, Darius, Darius. I like saying Darius uh, for whatever reason. It just sounds better. Uh, Darius the Great. Uh, he proclaimed himself victorious in all battles during the period of upheaval, attributing his, his success to the grace of Ahura Mazda. And so the inscription uh, is three versions of the same text written in three different cuneiform script languages. Uh, the first one is Old Persian. The second one is a language called Elamite. And the third language is Babylonian, which is a variety of Akkadian. So Old Persian, Elamite, and Babylonian, tri trilingual inscription. 
1598, uh, as far back as 1598, Englishman Robert Shirley saw the inscription during a diplomatic mission to Persia on behalf of Austria, and he brought, it atten he brought the, the attention to it to Western European scholars. But it wasn't until 1835 until a British officer in the East India Company by the name of Sir Henry Rawlinson, uh, who was assigned to the forces of the Shah of Iran, he began to study the inscription uh, in earnest. So we can thank uh, Sir Henry Rawlinson for the, uh, dis not discovery, but rediscovery of the Bayesian inscription, and finally uh, the uh, and decipherment we'll talk about in a second. But it is the Rosetta Stone of Mesopotamia. All right. I think that's it. Yeah, I thought I had another slide for that. The next picture is actually a sketch of the Atapana of not Persepolis, but Susa. But the reason why I included it is I want you to see what it might have looked like when it was built and when it stood up. And I want you to notice on the front of that, you see the columns. On the tops of those columns, there are these really magnificent bulls that are carved in a very, very high degree of relief. And at the OI, uh, at the Oriental Institute, uh, if you come to one of our tours, you actually get to see artifacts from the Atapana of Persepolis. And this is, you see the raised platform, you can see there the carvings, uh, and you can see the columns uh, as they stand today. Many of the, of the window seals and architraves are still standing. So if you go to, if you visit Iran, and uh, I recommend that if, you want to do that, uh, that would be really cool. I would love to visit this site. It is a on, I have not been there, uh, but I believe it is on UNESCO's World Heritage Site. Uh, it is truly remarkable. Uh, the site was burned by Alexander the Great when he came through on conquest. And one quick word about that, Alexander the Great had a uh, pretty lenient policy when it came to nations that he wanted to uh, destroy. Uh, and some scholars were puzzled as to why Alexander the Great uh, destroyed and burned Persepolis. And uh, I've heard one scholar say, and I think he's probably right, the reason why that was the case is because the Persians also sacked Athens, I believe it was, earlier. So he wanted to kind of get them back from that. So that's why, that's what, that was what it was eventual fate was. It fell into ruin. It got covered up. And then nobody really went there, it got abandoned until uh, it began to be excavated once again. But you can see there in the fore, uh, in the foreground, once again, we're all, all the way over here in Iran, but you see one of the themes is uh, uh, from an from a artistic standpoint, uh, bulls and lions. They kind of symbolize royal power in Persia as well as Anatolia, in Israel as well, uh, not so much so in Egypt, uh, you got the snake and the vulture, you got some other animals, uh, but in the other parts of the Near East, you've got the lion and uh, the Asiatic lion. And there is a really remarkable example that you can see at the OI. You see there, uh, the wall there, the, the processional way, uh, or processional uh, wall there, the retaining wall, there's, uh, it contains lots of scenes of uh, subdued people groups, that many of the Achaemenid kings subdued in their conquest of the ancient world, uh, showing them, in fact, uh, the, this was actually meant to instill fear on the people groups that they subjugated. So if, uh, if you were part of the height of the, uh, of the Persian Empire, almost like Roman Empire, uh, and you subjugated a people group, they would bring in your royal officials and they would march you up these stairs and, and it was all very like dramatic. It was to show you like, look at how great we are. Look at how powerful the Persian kingdom is or the Achaemenid kingdom is. These towering columns with bulls and you've got all these paintings. It was very, I mean, it, it would have been very amazing to see in person. And this is what's left today. By the way, this is of course where Queen Esther would have been. So you're seeing something that Esther would have seen with her own eyes uh, during the time of Xerxes. This is another uh, artist rendition of what it might have looked like during the day. You can see the bulls there. I'm about to show you some artifacts. Uh, before we get to the OI, this is not at the OI. This is actually, I believe, where is this? It slips my mind off the top of my head. British Museum or maybe the Louvre, I'm not sure. I, I usually have this on there, but it was discovered in Babylon by uh, Hormuz Rassam. Uh, it's baked clay. 
this is basically uh, direct evidence of Cyrus's repatriation of the Jewish people after the Babylonian captivity, and it directly affirms Ezra chapter one. So this is the, Cyrus, of course, is the founder of the Achaemenid Empire. Here are some of the bulls from the Adapana, the columns at the Oriental Institute. And you can see there how remarkable these things are, how beautifully carved they are. And you can see there on the sides of their head, there's these little holes. And we believe that gold, golden horns came out of these things. Uh, so the contrast between the beautiful dark stone, carved stone, and the gold, which would have been highly polished, would have been just absolutely breathtaking to see hundreds of these things uh, in the Adapana, Apadana, excuse me, Apadana, it's, it's, it's confusing. <laughs> this one is uh, the, most, the, the largest example at the OI, and you can see there the ears would have probably been gold as well as the horns. This thing is massive. Uh, it's really hard to see in this photograph how large this bull head is, but it is really, really big. And uh, there's another angle of it. And you can see there the ornateness of the carving. Pretty amazing. One other thing, this is another uh, creature that was actually, I believe, uh, that actually supported the beams that supported the uh, uh, Adapana. So kind of this mythical creature, this Lamasu. You see this creature in Assyria. Oh, by the way, the other Lamasu that I mentioned, you know, and I mentioned, I mean to mention this on the previous lecture, on his head, you see the little crown thing he's got on his head. It looks like there's, uh, there's like three little things going up. Those are actually represent horns, and there are three horns on each side. So six horns represents, it's, it's a magical uh, creature. That's what it symbolized. That's what it symbolized to the ancient Persians. And that's also on the same, uh, on the same Lamasu of Khorsabad um, uh, in, uh, in, in Iraq, also had the six horns as well. And I may show you that in just a second. Um, yeah, there it is. So this is the capital of the man bull, uh, the tripylon members of the Persepolis expedition discovered fragments of stone capitals topped by pairs of composite creatures that combine features of both men and bulls. The capitals originally supported the roof beam of the hall, which rested on the backs of the man bulls. The form of the columns below these capitals are shown in the drawing to the right. So you see how elaborate this thing was. And this picture is really cool. This is actually at the OI. And one of my favorite things at the OI, I love this. I, every time I visit, I actually go and get really close to this and look at it. You're not supposed to touch it, but I read it really close. And uh, this is in stone. And you can see these lions there to the bottom of that. This is a window seal. And I imagine, just my, using my imagination, I imagine Queen Esther uh, looking out, gazing out at this window, uh, perhaps thinking about her homeland, maybe Hadassah, uh, in her flowing, beautiful, you know, royal attire, and maybe some silk curtains flowing out of that window. That's that's a window seal, and that would have looked out uh, out of the uh, outside of the palace. And there's a closer up view of the lions with the uh, flower motifs. It was another sort of a motif of royalty and uh, and power as well. Some other really remarkable artifacts uh, in the Persian gallery are these uh, copper and bronze uh, wrappings. This, in, this, this one is a griffin, uh, these griffin motifs you find uh, that would be wrapped around a cedar column or a cedar post. Sometimes it'd be doors uh, or the other types of uh, things that would be found in the palace. And perhaps the most well-known, this is actually the bull I was showing you earlier about that uh, that stairway, and uh, this artifact actually just came back to the Oriental Institute Museum early this year, I believe it was early this year, and uh, the people on my last OI tour actually got to see this. I believe, I can't remember off the top of my head, was it in Boston or New York, the Met? I can't remember, but it was on loan from one of the other museums, and there was some legal battle, and it was supposed to come back to the OI, and I don't know if there was a lawsuit, but something happened, but it, it came back to the OI and there it is today because it was originally 
excavated by the Oriental Institute at their Persepolis expedition. And we made an artifact graphic of this. Uh, if you would like to get that, it is on our Facebook page in the pictures. So scroll through the pictures, you can see uh, this and you can download this and save it to your phone or whatever you'd like to use it for. It also, also uh, most of these things are also on our Instagram page. So if you don't follow us on Instagram, check us out on Instagram and uh, you can get all these pictures on Instagram as well. We're going to finish up with this. This is some of the most elaborate things that was discovered at Persepolis. Uh, in fact, uh, the Oriental Institute itself, their very emblem of the OI is this winged griffin to the left. So whenever you, if you ever get a letter from the OI, you'll see Oriental Institute, it'll have this little griffin. That's their sort of symbol for the Oriental Institute. And then also these other uh, golden uh, artifacts, perhaps earrings or some type of other jewelry uh, that was discovered uh, at Persepolis. Lions, make some pretty nice earrings, ladies, don't you think? Or something, I don't know what you'd put it on. I have no idea. I, I kind of, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but it, they're, they're really small. And uh, I'm guessing that they went on either a bracelet or a necklace or something like that, but they are gold. And this is, uh, the, there's the picture of the Lama Sioux, one of our, uh, one of our trips. And so uh, we had a great time. Just to show you the size of this thing. And you can see there, uh, this is a better picture of the Lama Sioux at Korsabad. Um, and you can see the six horns there on the, on the crown of this. Uh, and the, the it's actually had the face of Sargon II. That was the face that it did contain his face. So anyway, so, uh, this is just a sampling, as I said, of the many artifacts at the Oriental State Museum. Uh, as you get through the Persian Hall, uh, there's another section that gets into um, uh, some other areas in North Africa, or actually in Nubia as well. Uh, but uh, we don't really, uh, you know, some of the stuff really doesn't deal with biblical artifacts. We do go through it, but uh, it's not, we let, allow people to go through it on their own. So I think that's it. So yes, I'm gonna go ahead and stop it there, stop sharing now, and see if you guys have any questions, uh, but I will have to check my Facebook. Uh, so give me one second here, see if you guys have any questions on this. So let's see here. Give me one sec. Thank you guys for your patience earlier, and um, it's been fun. And I hope that you have enjoyed this. And uh, we're going to do more of these. So let's see here, four comments. I'm going to have to turn the volume down. Uh, how does Darius uh, of Daniel fit into the history? Um, I'm not sure Darius of Daniel you're talking about. Um, Daniel, the end of the uh, Babylonian kingdom were, were the Medes and the Persians. So the first... It was basically Medo-Persia. So the Medes were the first one. It was Bel Belshazzar. Uh, and so we know that there was a sort of tight alliance between the Medes and the Persians uh, toward the end of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. And uh, give me a second here. and I will uh, see here. Yeah. The eldest son of uh, Nabonidus and co-regent with him and his father, uh, he was the last king of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Was, Empire was a king by the name of uh, Nabonidus, whose reign dates to 556 to 539. Uh, he was possibly killed when the Babylonian fell to the Medes and the Persians in 539 BC. Um, so uh, a couple other artifacts associated with that is the Nabonidus Chronicle, which we actually have an artifact graphic for, and then also the cylinder of Nabonidus. So that's how it fits in. It's Daniel chapter 5. Daniel 7, 1, and Daniel chapter 8, verse 1. So, all right, uh, Fiona is asking, uh, earlier you talked about post-flood life movement towards sedentary city dwelling. Do you hold uh, this view over standard hunter-gatherer Neolithic Revolution narrative? Uh, so, so basically, uh, the Neolithic Revolution. So what I think is happening with the transition from the Neolithic to the uh, agricultural is that uh, as the earth, as humans are beginning to slow down and they are stopping to follow animal herds, uh, they are living more sedentary lives uh, as the earth gets warmer after the Pleistocene. Uh, that is 
uh, that's how it fits in. So, um, so agriculture, people began to live more sedentary and they go down into, uh, down into Southern Mesopotamia, primarily in, uh, in um, a city called uh, Uruk uh, and also Iridu, two of the oldest cities in the world. Now there are other settlements that actually uh, date to uh, the uh, Neolithic period. There are technically not cities. So I believe that archeologists, as we designate cities, it has to be uh, socially stratified and there has to be uh, some type of monumental building and many of these Neolithic settlements, they did live in close quarters and, and we're still learning a lot more about uh, Neolithic life. In fact, one of the sites in Turkey that's fascinating is Gobeki Tepe. And uh, it is uh, where we believe, in fact, again, not just myself, but many archeologists believe uh, that that is where uh, animal husbandry began. And that is also where um, uh, agriculture began as well. So, Fiona, I think I hopefully I answered your question. If I didn't, then you can uh, send me an email or a private message, and I will try to get you some more information on that. Uh, but again, guys, thank you so much for watching uh, our second uh, lecture on the Oriental Institute artifacts. Again, this is just a sampling of the hundreds of artifacts at the Oriental Institute Museum uh, here in Chicago. So, if you are ever in the Chicago area and you would like to take a tour, when the museum opens back up, then I would be glad and happy to give you a tour of the OI. Uh, we're monitoring that uh, every day, making sure it, you know we, if we get word that it opens back up. So if you're in the Chicagoland area, uh, I will be putting things on Facebook so that you can know uh, when the museum will reopen. So uh, in any case, uh, do check out some of those links that I mentioned to you. Uh, check out especially the article, uh, The Discovery of the Hittites on epicarchaeology.org and then also Turkey Anatolia. Uh, that will give you some further insights. Also, on all of my articles, uh, you will see footnoted or endnotes. So scroll to the bottom if you want to know more books or references. There's also links as well. Uh, so do check those out. And uh, I will be uh, in touch with you guys about uh, additional lectures uh, as, we, uh, as we give them. And as I uh, have some ideas, I've been super, super busy now uh, the last few days. Um, with a ton of projects going on. We just recorded uh, four episodes with our colleagues and friends at Associates for Biblical Research, uh, in which I serve as an archeologist. Uh, and uh, we did a series on uh, defending the faith in a faithless world. And that's gonna be airing at the end of August and the 1st of September, 2020. Uh, so stay tuned to Epic Archeology span for further details on those episodes. So uh, check that out. And then uh, we're also working on a couple other things as well. So again, thank you so much uh, guys for watching. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your encouragement and uh, keep digging for the truth. And I will see you guys around. And if you have any questions, uh, please send me a message or email. My email is ted at epicarchaeology.org and uh, i'll try to get to your emails as soon as i possibly can but thank you guys for watching god bless you.